This is CBC Here and Now. Salvage some kind of uh, tourist season that we have to be uh, looking towards uh, doing some type of bubbling. We're not there yet. As I said, we've got to be able to make sure that we can travel safely around Newfoundland and Labrador first. An Atlantic-wide debate over an Atlantic-wide bubble. COVID-19 has been the cause of many cancellations this year, but here at the Kirk, they weren't going to let it stop their annual lobster fundraiser. I'm Jeremy Eaton. I'll tell you how they did it coming up on Here and Now. Good evening, I'm Carolyn Stokes. Well, one of the big topics today, will there be an Atlantic-wide bubble this summer? The four Atlantic premiers met to discuss it last night, and today the premier of PEI says he expects there to be travel within Atlantic Canada by July. But the other premiers say not so fast. We all recognize that uh, uh, to salvage some kind of uh, tourist season that we have to be uh, looking towards uh, doing some type of bubbling and that continues. We, uh, we didn't uh, pick a hard date. I didn't suggest we have a hard date. We're working toward uh, early July. So we agreed over the next um, few weeks to, to have our authorities work together to determine, you know, that, okay, we, we don't have any real issues here one way or the other. And, and our alignment is clear so that people come, if, if we get to the stage, which that is what we're working towards, um, we are in a point where people aren't confused about just crossing the border and all of a sudden they've got a different rule. And in a statement, Nova Scotia Premier Stephen McNeil says Nova Scotia is open to an Atlantic bubble, but we cannot put a date on it until we're sure our case numbers are low and the cases in other provinces remain low. So, Anthony, those are the other premiers. What are we hearing from our premier tonight? Well, Carolyn, I guess one thing that's changed several weeks ago when this came up, uh, Premier Dwight Ball wasn't even interested in talking with the other provinces, so that has changed. Last night, he did engage with them, but uh, Premier Ball, he may not want to burst anybody's bubble and the idea of the four provinces starting to open up together, but um, he's pretty cautious. Uh, on this yet, I mean, the uh, Premier uh, Premier King yesterday raised this issue with all the Atlantic provinces, but first and foremost, any decision, final decision that would be made on this would have to be made in consultation with our public health officials. You know, for us in Newfoundland and Labrador, and, no, and like New Brunswick and like PEI and other provinces, we also discussed the impact that it would have on tra travel ban bans because uh, they they have travel bans in place as we speak now as well. So first and foremost, you know, uh, we're not there yet. As I said, we've got to be able to make sure that we can travel safely around Newfoundland and Labrador first. And, you know, then speak with public health officials and they'll make a determination. As we keep our province safe, you know, is it then uh, time to actually looking at opening up the province to some travel outside. Uh, major consideration, and I did raise this last night, you know, for me, uh, just speaking about this as, a, as, a, as an individual, I guess, and as Premier of our province, recognizing we have close connections, not as much to the Atlantic provinces. We have great cooperation within Atlantic Canada, but we have a lot of family. We have a lot of friends that live in places like Alberta, and the number one destination for Canadians travel, traveling to Newfoundland and Labrador would, would be from Ontario. So these are all considerations before you know, these decisions are made with the evidence and science from the public health officials. What makes you think it's unsafe to travel around our province right now? Well, because we're working with public health officials and we saw just recently in New Brunswick where someone came in spending a few days in Quebec and look what's happened. And, and now we're seeing an outbreak. So if we were to open it up and travelers were to come in and freely move around from other provinces, we would expose some of the most vulnerable people in our society uh, to uh, positive cases of COVID. But does that mean, sir, that our goal now is eradication or wait for a vaccine? No, the goal is that we live with COVID. And so right now we're in alert level three, so which is, you know, we've been able to uh, get to alert level three successfully. The next stage is get to alert level two. We want to do that. Uh, successfully. I think there's all indications that we could be able to get there before the 28 days. At least that's the indication from the chief medical officer. 
So you follow the logic there, not necessarily safe to travel around our province, Carolyn, because we might actually go to some place where there could be an outbreak. Now in non-COVID news, although everything I guess is related to COVID, interesting issue came up with uh, Alison Coffin, the leader of the NDP, who made it very clear to the government that the, uh, her party will not support uh, paying the bills unless Dwight Ball does a better job of accounting for it, not going to support uh, lending the Liberals another $4 billion. Uh, well, I, uh, we've already given them $4 billion and we've had no accountability on how they're spending it. I do not think that, they, uh, that the Liberal government ought to have another $4 billion to do with what they will without a plan uh, without any, uh, and without any accountability. I think that is highly inappropriate. Well, this is one issue on which we stand together with the NDP. So as you see there, some, some agreement with the opposition. Interesting fact, I guess, that politics have come back, the politicians back this week, Two major issues that are on the table, of course, economic recovery and how to manage the backlog in health care. No clear roadmap yet, so that's going to dominate politics in our province. The politicians, they'll be back on Monday. Carolyn? Thanks so much, Anthony. Well, businesses are getting back into the swing of things across Newfoundland and Labrador, but for some, the climb back to normal is a challenge. Tenants in Big Goods Plaza have been trying to convince their landlord to apply for federal government rent assistance. But as here in now's Ariana Kelland reports, one tenant says it hasn't been easy. Kayla White's studio isn't big, and it doesn't have to be to photograph pint-sized newborn babies, a business that was flourishing before the pandemic closed shops and threatened the health of infants. Every year I, I project my year to see, uh, you know, what's coming, what I should expect, um, my overhead and all that good stuff. And I had projected a really good year for 2020. Maybe I jinxed it for everyone. It suddenly left this mom of three scrambling for ideas. Then came hope in the form of a government program. Justin Trudeau announced a commercial rent relief program in May. It offers an unsecured forgivable loan to commercial landlords. The aim is to help tenants by lifting the burden for the months of April, May and June. Sounds like good news. So White says she and other tenants began asking their landlord to apply. That was in May. John Biggood of Biggood's Property Management did not respond to CBC's email, but White says his silence doesn't signal much hope. We don't know if he's going to even try to apply for the, um, the rent relief. We're getting mixed signals. Sometimes he says yes and sometimes he says no. So um, I really don't know. The federal NDP has been calling for changes to the program to remove the onus from the landlord so that more tenants can avail of the funds. So far, the program details have stayed the same. Big commercial property owners like Crombie Reed that operates the Avalon Mall say they are in the process of applying to help out tenants. A spokesperson says it's a lot of work, but it's worth it. Back at Rock Baby Photography, the future looks uncertain. You know, I don't know. <laughs> it's really hard to say. Uh, you know, business is starting up again, but I work with babies, so it's a really sensitive, uh, it's a really sensitive kind of session. Uh, babies don't have an immune system, so for me to actually get back into the full swing of things, it's going to take me a while to catch up. When and if she does, White says she doesn't know if she'll stick around the plaza. That too is uncertain. Arianna Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. Well, councillors in Grand Falls, Windsor took to the streets today in protest. They're upset over a decision by provincial health authorities to move lab services to Gander. As here and now's Garrett Berry reports, the town council doesn't understand why the province is making this move. Not your normal council meeting. 10 or 12 years ago, we were promised when the uh, school boards were consolidated and the, the head office went to Gander, that Grand Falls Windsor would be the hub for health care. So where, where's that promise today? Their concern? Lab services are being taken out of this building in Grand Falls Windsor and being centralized in Gander. Councillors say their town has the training and a better location. We have lab samples from seven rural communities that are coming here right now. This proposal um, would mean that those samples would be redirected to Gander. And if you look at the 10 outlying communities, that is uh, the equivalent of 300 extra kilometers that those samples would have to be transported by courier daily. So their question, 
wine. We feel that we're not being treated fairly and we look forward to, uh, to a change of uh, attitude and really a change of heart when it comes to this decision because it doesn't appear to be fact-based to us. The town council has this list of questions that it wants answered, like if there are services being moved, how are there not going to be job losses? And if there are no job losses, where do the efficiencies come from? The Honourable the Minister of Health and Human Sorry. Services. The answer today? The lab reform was determined by a group of clinical lab scientists and pathologists uh, who made the recommendations to government. It is time to replace a significant amount of infrastructure in laboratories across the province. Uh, the level of service to those people in clinics and hospitals in Central West and in the periphery will not change, Mr. Speaker. In actual fact, it will be enhanced in the small hospitals. Central Health says it's about efficiencies, upgraded services, but this mayor says just think it through. When you dig deeper into the situation, you're cutting 50% of the lab work. So you're cutting 50% of the lab work, obviously it's going to have an impact on employees. Whether people are laid off now, in a year, five years, people will lose their jobs because of this decision. Both sides are meeting next week. Gary Perry, CBC News, Grand Falls, Windsor. Well, conversations about systemic racism and blatant bigotry are happening all around us right now. It's a conversation that Hassan High was spurring on social media, and it caused him to become the target of racial attacks. But it was his response that caught many people's attention. In a series of tweets about local culture, he turned the hate into humor. So I had tweeted, uh, I've been getting a lot of very hostile messages from people, misunderstanding what my goals are. So let me be clear, I plan on rotating Newfoundland so Cape Spear points to Mecca. Uh, the Ode to Newfoundland will be sung in Arabic, and K-Rock will play Dr. Jones by Aqua once an hour. I'm taking the S out of the rooms and making it one room, singular. Uh, I'm changing the KFC macaroni salad from the Newfoundland orange to the mainland cream color. I'm separating Grand Falls and Windsor, it's just not working out. Uh, I'm heating up all of your cold plates. I'm moving the Cape Spear Lighthouse to the Goulds. So what's the background to all of this? What prompted you to post all of those tweets? So th the background was I had been having some discussion in public forums about, uh, you know, the Black Lives, uh, Black Lives Matter movement uh, in Canada, around the world, and how internationally we're, uh, people are looking at a lot of our monuments and and the historical figures with very problematic backgrounds, which are rooted in racism, white supremacy, uh, you know, the genocide of indigenous people, slavery, all those horrible things. Now, some people got their backs up because any time, uh, particularly when a person of color um, in any way pokes at um, the perceived history or the right history or white history, uh, there, there's a bit of a backlash. So I was getting a lot, some, you know, threatening messages like, you know, how dare you or uh, people accusing me of wanting to destroy property, like I was going to tear down Cabot Tower or, you know, knock the lighthouse down or knock statues down. Uh, and so I said, you know what, if you're going to accuse me of, of, of breaking things and ruining things, I'm going to have some fun with this. I'm going to, I'm going to troll some trolls. And it was just like, all right, off we go. I'm changing by from B apostrophe Y to B underscore Y. Francois isn't Francois. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but someone had to tell you that. Uh, I moved Cabot Tower to Botwood. It's now a jungle gyms and has a gender neutral bathroom. What you gonna do? That was a bit confrontational, that one. <laughs> and what was the reaction like when you started posting all of those tweets? Oh my God. Because you were really on a roll. <laughs> well, once I started, I'm like, it was just like this, this stream of consciousness thing there. People were, were laughing. Uh, it was probably one of the biggest, like most engaging sort of tweet storms that I'd, I'd ever had. A lot of people had fun with it, but I mean, it was fun covering up a very serious subject. And it's like, it, ultimately, it's about racism, uh, n not just the subject matter of renaming or reassessing a lot of these monuments, but also it's the reaction that people are having. And it, it was often uh, very hostile reactions. People, you know, saying, go back to where you came from. You have no right here, you know, or, or and, and more threatening messages with more colorful language. My addressing it with humor doesn't mean that I'm immune to it and there isn't any hurt. I'm used to it and like, may, you know, maybe call it scar tissue. Well, it was nice to see someone take something so horribly negative 
and turn it into something kind of positive that made people smile and got people engaged. You know, it's funny. So it's like medicine. You know, you're going to take some really bad medicine and you might add some flavor to it here. Um, discussions about racism are the medicine. It's not the cure. That's the beginning there. My tactic sometimes, again, not all the time, is injecting some humor, making it a, maybe a more approachable conversation because there's a lot of people who are super uncomfortable talking about racism and race and, and these issues. And that's fair. It is an uncomfortable topic and you're going to be uncomfortable. And sometimes it's just it, what, what can help invite people into the conversation. But then the real work starts after when the jokes have faded and people stop laughing. You know, we roll up our sleeves and we get to work. Well, in other news tonight, St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church, also known as the Kirk in downtown St. John's, figured out a way to push forward with its annual lobster fundraiser. It took a lot more work. There were many more meetings and rules. Still, the Kirk managed to pull it off and sold 900 lobsters for a good cause. Here and now's Jeremy Eaton has the details. Normally, the lobster boil involves a sit-down meal here at St. Andrew's Church Hall. But 2020 is everything but normal. For 43 straight years, the Kirk pulled off the Crustacean fundraiser. For a while, it didn't look like the 44th version was going to happen at all. How would we do it? Uh, what are our restrictions? How would we pull it off? The committee here at the Kirk took every precaution, working with Service NL, the Department of Health, and even a doctor who happened to be a member of the congregation. They came up with a contactless plan. Harder on the head. Harder to plan. We took it uh, very seriously, have expert advice, both from a cooking side and also health care and legal for that matter. We certainly didn't want to cause any stress in the community over it. To avoid any problems, the Kirk hired Taylor's Fish, Fruit and Vegetable Market to cook up 900 lobsters, saving the volunteers a whole lot of time. We spend about eight hours straight boiling lobster. It still meant there was lots of work to do, though. A few hundred pounds of potatoes, 15 dozen hard-boiled eggs, 50 pounds of onions, 50 pounds of carrots, 50 pounds of coleslaw. Church volunteers worked in their bubbles inside the hall, making 450 lobster dinners. Uh, we took half of them today and half tomorrow. So like Rather than having the traditional dining in, they have no contact take out. In order to maintain our, uh, our regulations, our restrictions, and our social distancing this year, We've actually set up the parking lot so that uh, people will pull up. But it was important for the volunteers to make sure the 44th version wasn't missed. It allows a comfort, a family feeling, if you will. Um, I can't do an awful lot for society as a whole by myself, but when we get a group of us together, we can really make a difference. For two. Drivers pull up, give their names, and then make their way to this donated refrigerator truck, and the delicious dinner is dropped in their trunk. For people like Heather McClellan, it's a lot more than just a dinner. My father, Roy McClellan, he was here the first year. They had the lobster dinner, and they boiled them on camp stoves. And, uh, and so we've been having lobster dinners in our family ever since. The money raised goes towards a number of charities, including Bridges to Hope and the John Howard Society, groups that help out people in the community where the Kirk sits. Aside from the funds raised, the church group has proved it can put together meals despite COVID-19. It's kind of like a test run for us to do it this year uh, to keep some sort of normalcy and celebration and also to learn a process whereby if it really becomes necessary, then I think we as a team, we could step up and, and be a great benefit to our community. For the organizers and the volunteers who helped pull this off, this big red brick building here behind me is a lot more than just a church. It's part of the community which makes pulling off this year's fundraiser all the more special. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's.
during this COVID-19 pandemic, life is different for you, for me, and for all of us at Here and Now. We're working apart and working from home like so many of you to maintain a distance and keep each other safe. Starting on Monday, June 15th, Here and Now will return to a 60-minute newscast, a full hour of your stories and the essential information you need the most. Weather update is brought to you by the sold out HCF Home Lottery. Thank you, Newfoundland and Labrador. Your support has been overwhelming. Prize winners will be announced on June 25th at hcfhomelottery.ca. Well, it was a beautiful evening if you were away from the coast. As you can see, lots of fog happening uh, along the coast, especially in those onshore winds and pretty chilly as well. Let's take a look at those temperatures reached a high near 12, actually 13 degrees in St. John's, only showing 12 there. And uh, actually Gander reached 20 degrees a little bit earlier this afternoon. Otherwise, those temperatures in the teens up through Happy Valley Goose Bay, as well as uh, Lab City, you saw a high near 10 degrees today. So what we have uh, happening is we've got an area of high pressure off the coast. That's what keep, is keeping that cloud cover at bay. Uh, through parts of central and the eastern areas of the island. Otherwise, we've got uh, the remnants of Cristobal moving in with along with a warm front. It's actually sparking some lightning up through uh, Lab West, and that's generally going to continue over the next couple of hours as it heads towards central as well. And then we've got some showers happening along the west coast, and that will generally continue. Those showers will continue to spread across the big land tonight and then make their way towards the west coast as we head into after midnight into the early morning hours along the south coast that'll generally be drizzle or some showers as well but you'll note the winds will pick up anywhere from 50 to as much as 70 kilometers per hour uh, expected tonight and then this coastal fog as well anywhere in those onshore winds is more than likely where we'll see that fog so tomorrow generally going to be a wet day on the west coast otherwise looking at a mix of sun and cloud but those winds will continue and then up through Labrador, things will generally clear out, except some more showers will move in for you for Lab West and head towards Central as you head into the evening and overnight hours. And there's that other round of showers that will move in late day as the, towards the interior, as well as the south coast of the island. However, temperatures tomorrow will be much nicer. At least they should be reaching a high near potentially 18, 19 degrees for St. John's. Again, keeping those winds uh, out of the south or south southwest tomorrow. So cooler in those onshore winds along with some fog for the southern shore. And then we've got uh, some 22 degree temperature for Happy Valley Goose Bay. So much different than what we saw today. Nain, you should see a high near nine degrees. And then as we head into Saturday, hanging on to these warmer temperatures. However, again, gonna keep with that uh, potential for some showers heading towards central this time, but it does look like Eastern areas of the island will see plenty of sunshine through the day, at least through your first half. And then Cartwright dropping back down again, down to five degrees as the afternoon high. So a little bit of a roller coaster uh, over the next couple of days. Temperatures by Sunday will drop back down to the teens. This looks like this will be the end of that. And then by the time we head to uh, the middle and end of next week, another warm up is on the way. So that's certainly good news there. Temperatures generally 19, 20, 21 degrees for Western Newfoundland. A little cooler for Central though, and a generally unsettled weekend uh, for you. And then up through Labrador Eastern areas, you're looking at uh, a little bit of a cool down on Saturday and then back up to those 19, 20 degree temperatures. And then for Western Labrador, once we get that rain out of the way on Saturday, it looks like Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday look beautiful. I had to share this great shot of a perfect evening paddle in Triple Falls Park. Thank you to Tina for sending that photo in. If you have any weather photos to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca.
Welcome back. People can now make a virtual appointment with a nurse practitioner. The provincial government has announced the existing 811 health line will be enhanced to improve access to primary care. People can now schedule a virtual appointment with a nurse practitioner for urgent, non-emergency health issues via telephone, text or video. Well, police are advising people that a large chunk of the trailway has washed out. It happened about halfway between the Whitburn access and Route 100. Police say the washout is treacherous and the trailway in that area is not accessible. There is dangerous, fast moving water running through it and safety barricades have been erected. People are being asked to stay away until it's fixed. Well, that's it for us tonight. Thank you so much for spending uh, some time with us this evening. Hope you can join us again tomorrow for what looks to be a beautiful Friday in St. John's. Good night.